Yeah. I always forget you look like two blocks away. Yeah. I didn't know, I didn't know, yeah. And that's, yeah. that's part of the reason you get changed. I was like, the kids got to go to work. So I went to get them going early, you know? And we're in that value of a dollar. Yes. Don't move along. Yes. One year old. Not even half Not even half Yeah. 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 That's not happening. Well, okay, I will draw in. You can see over here. You can see all here. Yeah, that's pretty good. You can see most of the board, yeah. All right. So, <laughs> geometric deep learning. What's this all about? We're at, um, and again, sorry for the uh, delay in uh, Chalk Talks. Uh, they're going to be back. This is going to be a two parter Chalk Talk this week and next week. We're not going to talk too much about deep learning right now. What we're going to talk about is Riemannian manifolds and shapes and differential geometry and discrete differential geometry and all preparation for um, machine learning. But we're going to start off with machine learning. For my benefit and hopefully for some of you guys. So let's talk about convolutional neural nets. Neural networks. Classic example of a convolutional neural network is to give it an image. Let's say we have an image and uh, that's 256 by 256. I love putting numbers down. And we want to determine what's inside this image. Is there a cat or uh, um, <clears throat> or what is uh, what's what's going on inside this image? We want to classify the image. Is there a cat there, a person, a bike, a car, or whatever? We're gonna we're gonna train a neural net to figure out what's inside that image. All right. So let's start right off. Let's go back and review convolutional neural nets. Now the first thing you do is you treat this thing as a great big array. Right. This is an array of pixels, and we're going to create a convolutional layer, which means that we're going to create a Filter, a filter. Well, let's say it's a five by five, five elements in it, or whatever, whatever. And you do this clapping on. So the the filter gets passed over the image and produces a new image. So you take this filter and you you know, multiply the elements and add them all up, and that produces a new image. So you run this filter over the pixel value, and then you slide the filter over one pixel, and then you run the filter value. You do this over and over again, and you start filling in the and you get new pixel values. And what you're basically doing is looking at how well what this filter is doing is trying to figure out something in the original. Oh, the reef has left the conference. That's okay. They can rejoin. We are on life size clouds. All they have worked, nobody right now. But that's okay. So the filter doop, 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 goes across, produces this image. And say you've got a little filter that's really good at picking out edges. Well, as this filter encounters edges in the right direction, light up. We'll say, ooh, I've got, I found a uh, that's actually got an edge in that right direction. Don't worry about the filters yet. We're going to learn. So eventually, the reef is joined the conference. As it kind of sucks. Um, but, uh, yeah, well, whatever. All right. So, what this is. Producing sort of a what you know, people call this activation map. And we're looking to see whether or not there's something in this image that sort of fits with that filter. 
Now we don't do it with just one filter, we do it with a bunch of filters. So let's do, do right? And so that actually is going to produce three separate, and this is this is all black and white images, black and white images. Oh. Hold on. Nobody else seems to have joined the conference, so I'm going to call the brief directly. Uh, yeah. Dude, yeah, let's. Uh, the life size cloud is not helping us right now, and nobody else has joined. So let's let's do this. Perfect. That's way better. Okay, so in our convolutional layer, we're actually going to have five different filter banks that we're going to run over this image. Filter banks is going to be looking for some, we'll talk about how what these guys are looking for in, in just a bit. So this produces three different layers of images. Remember, these filters are looking for things, right? They're, they're going to be looking for what the, the overall goal of this is, is there a cat in there? Or is there a bicycle in there? But what we're doing at the very beginning of this whole process is saying, well, it's right off the bat. But what I can do pretty good is find edges or little curly cues or a little corner that looks like the eye or something like that. We're, we're going to look for just features that I can find in the image. The plane of a brick wall or something. I'm not features in there. So I want to know that. Now, once I've done this, Notice that I've got this activation map that's going to have low values where I don't see the feature that I'm looking for, or high values where I do see the feature that I'm looking for. And they could be anywhere in here. But what this thing is doing is saying whether or not I've seen that feature. That's all it's doing. It's just saying that's it. It could be over here, it could be over there, it could be over here. And so one of the things that happens is after this layer, and this is layer, the next step in a convolutional neural net is often to reduce the, the um, resolution of this. Uh, filter across this. We don't let the filter fall off the edge of the image. So this image is like 256 minus or uh, 5, right? Because you, can, you only get uh, a pixel when you can fully fit the pix uh, the filter in there. So you can only fit that in there. And this is 256 minus 5. But then the next thing is pooling. We want to reduce it even more. And we look at all three of these different images and we say, you know what? I don't really care where the feature is. What I do care about is whether it exists or not. I do kind of say because I, I need to know whether I want to see if their feature correlates with other features later on down the line. But what I really care is does that feature exist? So what the pooling does is it is another kind of filter where you look over these pixels, maybe a three by three um, realm, and you say, are any of those pixels in there hot? Do this high max pooling. Or we look to see what's the value. And if there is one, we're going to put a pixel here that has that high value. Maybe it's a 0.9 here. We move that pool of pixels and do a, a step. We don't go one over. We actually go three over. So we're actually reducing the size of this. And we look, is that feature active in this thing? And maybe it isn't. So maybe this one only has a 0 0.02. And then we move it over again. And maybe there's a point four here. You can see what this is doing. All it's doing is waiting to see if that feature exists. So we're pushing this over, over and over, and, and just scrunching this. I do this wrong. We get an image that's a third the size of this. So it's 256 minus 5 divided by 3, whatever the hell that is. Then we do it all over again. 
we run this through actually an uh, activation function. Uh, you can have uh, the activation function, a nonlinear activation. And this is the, uh, you've seen this 10H, I've talked about this in, in, in stuff. There's 10H or, or R-E-L-U or all, all sorts of things basically say whether or not we should run these, the values that we're getting through here. Through um, We put a little nonlinearity on it to make it exciting. And then we do it all over again. We have another convolutional neural net with more filters that produce more images. But now, when this runs, it's actually running on this weird image, right? This weird image no longer looks like this image at all. It's basically an image that says whether or not that feature was activated. And by the way, we get lots of these, or we get just as many images here. So now when we run this convolution on this bank of images, we can do, uh, as in, we can get some really fun convolutions going on here, where you're looking at all these images and you're doing another convolutional filter, looking for more features. This whole thing, convolutional neural nets that really blows my mind, is that now this thing looks for edges, features. And then after this, we have this thing that says whether or not there are those edges inside the image. Now we're looking for features of the feature image, right? So we're looking again for edges, but not edges in the original image, but edges in the whether or not the feature exists image, which is super cool. That we found. We're looking at it and going, hey, well, I know a cat usually has um, ears and so some corners of eyes and some ears, and they were close to each other. I'm looking for that kind of thing then maybe this really is a cat. And we do this over and over and over again. Is, ooh, that's even better. I don't actually do this. You have a CN, uh, convolutional layer that produces a whole bunch of images. It goes through a pooling layer. It goes into another convolutional layer, but I'm going to draw them smaller because you're working on a, different, a smaller set of images. It goes through another pooling layer. And as you go farther and farther down, you can have as many of these things as you want. Eventually, you get down to a thing where it's producing images that are pretty dinky, right? There's maybe, uh, maybe this has gone down to 25 by 25 after all this subtraction and division. Well, finally, at this point, you can set it up with a fully connected layer. So no longer that, this is a fully connected Um, uh, neural net layer, and then at the end of all of this, it produces a balance <laughs> up into a crazy thing, and it spits out. And if it's a one, it's a cat. If it's a two, it's a uh, bicycle. If it's a three, it's a car, and so on. We, or there's lots of ways of doing this classification. Kind of the key thing here: there's some really interesting things in, going on in this convolutional neural net that are going to lead us into this paper is that it's taking advantage of the gridded structure of this thing. So what do I mean by that? Think about this picture of a cat. Is that This is a picture of a cat that is over on the bottom right corner of this image. In fact, the way this thing works is it doesn't really matter where that cat is in this image. You think about it. The first thing that we're going to do is pass a filter over there looking for edges. And it's going to go swooshing through here and looking for edges. And it's going to create this activation map saying, is there an edge here? Is there an edge here? And so it, it looks like it has some spatial information. But then the very next thing that we do is we scrunch down that spatial information, kind of throwing it away, throwing away the fact that there is an edge here and saying, you know, I don't really care if there's an edge there as long as there's, you know, yeah, what I really care is if there's an edge that's close to an eye that's close to another edge, right? I get that ear thing that represents a cat. So all of a sudden, I'm taking this filter 
looking for the edges, pooling it, scrunching it, and throwing away some of the spatial information of the image, and then doing it again. There's still a little bit of spatial information because we want to know whether or not one thing is close to another thing. So we know that, yeah, there's an edge, and then there's not an edge, but then there might be a little bit of an edge kind of thing, and, and this one might be looking at eyes and stuff. So we can do another convolutional pass where we can start to see, well, wait a sec, there's... If, if I have an edge here, then and I see another edge, then that's good. And then so on and so on. And, and in fact, that's kind of what happens. This, this first edge, or the first convolution pass, is looking for little teeny details that it can pick out with a five by five filter. The next convolutional pass is looking for bigger details, like whether or not there's an edge next to a, a flat bit. And then the next one after that is starting to look at actual contextual stuff where it's looking at, well, okay, I found the edges in the flat bit. Now is there a nose nearby? And so you, you start looking for this and it builds it up and you pull this out, not caring exactly where the cat is. And of this. The cat can slide the cat gill to a certain extent. It's, you know, scale, tra translational invariance with this stuff is really well supported with this structure. Deformation, whether or not the cat is rotated or scaled or something like that, that's also in here, but it's a little harder to sort of wrap your head around. So how does this all work? Now, if I, if I have an image and I have these filters, you can kind of think, oh, okay, you send the image through, you run these filters, you pull it, you run this right there, and eventually it spits out whether or not it's a cat. Again, the way you figure out those filters is you take 10,000 images and you know exactly what's in each one of those images. Here's 700 pictures of cats. Here's 60,000 pictures of bicycles. And you start passing it through here, looking at the answer that it spits out, and pushing changes back to all the convolutional filters that, thing, that the filters adapt to the task that you're asking it to do. Yeah. Okay. So are we on board? All good? We're uh, up to speed. We've had a really fast introduction to the convolutional neural nets. And we've talked about some of the cool features about it. So now, the whole paper that we're talking about is saying, <clears throat> this whole field which this paper reviews, and this is, you know, the convolutional neural nets on images and sound is has been around for ages, and convolutional neural nets on <coughs> geometry or non-images and sounds is really it's undergoing a lot of change right now. So images are a no-brainer. Um, the uh, check mark sound. So that's images are a gridded structure. Sounds actually are a gridded structure. It's just a you know, grid is a one D grid. You've got sounds. Check mark. Even the pre. It's choppy. Remember, images on, are um, using convolutional neural nets to help in volume rendering. So volumes, like clouds. So we have a poofy cloud, and it's represented by a 3D voxel grid. Convolutional neural nets, easy peasy. Because, again, it's just now instead of a, a 1D filter or a 2D filter, it's now a 3D filter. So easy. But then we throw this at it. We throw, you know, some sort of piece of geometry of a person, and there's my crazy geometry of a crazy person. And we want to run a convolutional neural net on somebody out of triangles, and the triangles are different shapes. And how the hell do we do that? And that's actually what uh, some people asked uh, about 10 years ago. How do you run a neural network on something that isn't a regular Euclidean gridded structure? All right. That's the question that we're going to try to solve today and next week.
So, now we go into the paper. And I want to make sure I've, I've check marked all the check marks here. So we have seen, and by the way, this paper is awesome. Um, it's 23 pages long. It's crammed full of math. And it starts off at a decent pace. And then you can see the, the authors kind of are like, holy sp we need a three-page paper, and this is way longer than this. This could be a book. And so at the end, they kind of zip to the end. It's a little disappointing. But other than that, it's a great paper. Um, you just have to really embrace the math. I, don't know. I guess the other thing to note here is that uh, just to help think about the underlying problem, what we're able to do is compute derivatives. Yes. Right? That's all. Whole point of that training really is just and you know on images it's easy you've got regular pixels it's just you know difference in pixel values over the size of a pixel um, sound is what the one D problem so that's easy volumes volume to get it is geometric deep learning too just easy. It's just easy geometry. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, and what Nafi said should echo in your mind the entire time of here. In fact, that's what we're going to talk about next is, is the cool thing about this is if I've got a picture of a cat, think about what the filter was doing. If I've got a picture of a cat and I've got, I'm looking for and obviously a weirdly drawn cat. One of the things that I'm doing here is putting a filter across this thing. And I'm looking to see if, and maybe this filter has got, has been tuned to look for edges that go in that direction. So I can easily do that. Uh, again, if this cat is over here or over there, but uh, you can see that I can compare the difference between these things. I can easily do this on this thing because I know that this pixel is next to this pixel is this next to this pixel is next to the 3D piece of, you know, a cat that comes into 3D. I'll put some shading on here and happy cat, a little nose, and I've got a really nicely drawn on my, and, and this is all triangles. And, and, and what if it isn't triangles? What if it's quad? The record point in this cat. How do we apply a filter so that it actually makes sense? So he was talking about derivatives. I'm applying talking about filters, and it's it's just weird. And and think about this: the cat, the, this filter, the the RGB values of the cat, say the position of where that cat is in the image, move or don't move, or well. Position of the cat changes, but the RGB values that the filter is looking at don't change because the cat is just translated in the image. But if I apply a translate to this, all the values of those vertices of my cat have now changed, right? What if I rotate this cat? So now, rotating the, the cat in here, perfectly fine, but the pixel values that I'm doing the filter on change, or, or don't change. I'm still looking at a color in a third background when I'm comparing the filter there. Here, the vertex values of this cat are undergoing crazy value changes. There are also any filter that I've got has to be aware of that. Or does it? <laughs> See, I'll, I'll throw in another terminology. <laughs> Which is out of um, the primary problem and the underlying problem here is that images, sounds, and volumes have a domain, underlying domain. Uh, images have a 2D domain, uh, say 256 by 256. Sound has a 1D domain, say represented by the RGB values or the amplitude, uh, and in a case of the voxel grid density you yeah. have um, points that are, where it's present or not present. Uh, with manifolds, the manifold itself is 
the domain. The non local like color values or uh, scale of don't on on the top four. Right. Absolutely correct. Uh, the, you know, depending on what you're doing, this geometric field. So very interested in meshes, but you can start thinking about the things that you could do deep learning on, like social networks. In the paper, they talk about this. You have you have a person and another person and another person and another person and another person, and you want to know if certain people like the same thing. So what do you have? You have whether or not the people are connected, right? You have this crazy ass thing this person people like each other and, and so on. You have this very weird graph that represents connections between people. And you happen to know that this guy likes horror movies, likes horror movies, and this guy likes uh, comedies and so on. And, and romance is over here. And remember, that work here is full of 300 million people. So we want to look at a person in this network and predict whether or not they're going to like horror movies based on their uh, the people they know. So cool. So now you do have values in the network, but you have this crazy network that doesn't look like any of this stuff. It's the the picture I sent out with the the chalk talk announcement was um, that picture was a visualization of paper referrals to other papers. So if one paper refers to another paper, there's you get this. And so um, each paper has a classification about what it is and, and, and uh, has an abstract that has the, uh, some of the keywords in its abstract represented as a, a sort of vector. And so what they were interested in is, if I add a new paper, where do I add it to this network? Oh, it's so cool. And the this is some learning techniques. If only we could do something like convolutional neural nets to that. Or if we go back to our 3D geometry, you we were talking about looking at just the shape of an object. So if I have a, an object of a cat and I want to compare it or see if it falls into the cat kind of class, that's one thing. But you can actually say, well, you know, I've got a signal on this cat. I've got um, the coloration on the cat. And I want to I want to do a convolutional neural net where I'm actually looking at the image that's on uh, the texture of this cat. Even there, that's tricky because the resolution of the cat, how the cat is being built, whether it's being built with quads or uh, uh, triangles, even if you're trying to do a convolutional filter on this thing, it's still a pain in the ass because it's gross. So. We have to come up with a way of dealing with this. And luckily, there's a huge amount of math out there to do just this. So the, the paper talked about this. This is the geometry of manifolds. and graphs. All right. Our main goal is to generalize convolutional neural network type construction. On a, so a, a grid that's regularly structured, this is a Euclidean domain. So we've got x direction and y direction. We know our neighbors. We can do derivatives. We, can, we know exactly what's going on. But what if we've got a social network graph or a crazy, well, uh, just a piece of geometry that's made up of triangles? How do we deal with that? All right. First of all, we're going to find some terms. So this whole thing falls into differential geometry. And a caveat. 
differential geometry is always given. Whenever I get into differential geometry, I have to start thinking about it because it's weird. It's it's different, it, and I have a very 1980s computer uh, graphics kind of view of meshes. There, they have 3D locations of their vertices, and you can find out who you're connected to, and that's about it. Differential geometry says, hold up, let's back off from that. That's that's way too groundly in space. Think of, think of this as, well, think of a, think of a, it's a sphere, right? And in fact, this is a great example. What if I wanted to do convolutional neural nets on a planet? Say we had satellite images of a planet that are mapped to the sphere, and I wanted to do a convolutional neural net. I, make, I made this example up beforehand, so it may be wrong, but it sounds like a cool example. So I've got uh, the, you know, the various prediction or whether, to make it, let, let's make it simpler. I want to determine whether or not there is a cyclone going on on the planet given the satellite images of the entire planet. So over here, We've got a, a cyclone that's going on, and whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. So in my images, here I'm looking for hurricanes, but on a sphere. So you go, ah, that's easy. That's easy. We can take the spheres that were on the sphere and wrap it, unwrap it onto a, um, an image or a texture map, and it's a square, and it looks just like an image more on a convolutional neural network. I mean, and I say, yes, absolutely, you could. There are some issues with that because taking a text and wrapping, unmapping it onto a square, you're getting a huge amount of distortion. So a cyclone over here is going to look small, a cyclone over here will look enormous, and your, your neural net is going to have to figure that out. I'd rather do it on this. Rather, I want to know, I've got a sphere that I'm represented with, you know, triangles or quads or something. And I have a whole bunch of small triangles over here. I've done a horrible job of my triangulation of the sphere. And I have some big triangles over here that represent the, the points of the, the, the image. How do I run a convolutional filter on this so that it works so I can actually detect a hurricane? So, one of the simplest examples is a sphere of a surface modeling our planet around a point. It seems to be plain. Which is the flatness of the Earth, but it is not. <laughs> Formally speaking, this is a d dimensional manifold surface. All right. Now, this is where differential geometry and, and Euclidean geometry just have to break apart like this, I see all the time a coordinate system. There's my sphere and that I can look at sitting in a coordinate and figure out how far away it is from the origin. I can do all sorts of stuff like that. Got it. The sphere, that's one of the things that we don't want in our Remember, I want to, that, that's actually something that will turn it, because the sphere changes. Each one of the vertices of this thing is going to change its x, y, z location in this. In differential geometry, they say, break it apart. Take away that coordinate system that uh, this thing is embedded in. And think about just the sphere. And if you think about just the sphere, think about you. Here I am in Los Angeles, and I'm sitting right there. And I'm on a sphere right now, but if you ask me, tell me where I am, I'm actually certain that I'm on a plane. I, you know, I can see I'm on the ground, I'm on a plane, because I have a very limited view of my world. And I know I have just a couple of a location on that sphere, which is X, which is not a 3D location on the point, it's just a point on this manifold. And I can basically test flat. I have 
I have a direction. I have this sort of tangent. I can tell you the tangent vector of where I'm at my location. I don't know anything else about this kind of stuff. I don't know that I'm a, I just know that I'm right there and I can tell you that it's flat in this direction. I can tell you the tangent of my world is going in this direction and actually, you know, it goes around there. But I can tell you the tangent plane. And it's easy because I just stand up and I can say, hey, I'm standing on a, on a tangent plane. That is super key. So what you have is, let's see, formally, the Earth, formally speaking, is a uh, um, d-dimensional manifold surface, well, actually manifold, let's just call it manifold, and they represent this in the paper with the, the letter X. That's, that's our surface. At, um, where each point X Logically equivalent, which is homeomorphic, to a d-dimensional Euclidean space called the tangent space. So this thing also has a tangent space, and the paper refers to that as T x, which is my location of x. So. On every point, and every x point of this, we know that there's a point on the surface, and we know the direction of the tangent. And here's the next thing that you have to uh, divorce itself that differential. That vector is in this three. You know, the vector, the vector saying that this is the tangent space inside this manifold. So this vector also. Even though it kind of, you know, you see pictures of differential geometry where you see a surface that looks like this, and then they draw a vector off the point here, and it looks like it's floating above the tangent space. But that's just the drawing. It's actually this tangent plane doesn't live within the tangent plane that's defined by the surface. And so it's, it's much more mathematical than this embedded 3D stuff. Hard. You can see why this. This is super. By the way, there's a huge amount of math based on this kind of stuff. But all of a sudden, think about the convolutional neural net. We have somehow taken ourselves away from this hard to deal with 3D world that we're in, and now we have all our stuff to find lo locally to that cat in that image. If only we. Can use this. Yeah. All right. The collection planes on all points were formerly known as their disjoint union, is referred to as a tangent bundle. And see, so X is all the tangents across this entire thing. So there's tangents, tangents, it's just all the tangents along here. And then, this is key, and this is kind of weird, there is an inner property, inner. Product. The inner product, I think, of dot products, right? The, the, this is actually a dot product, but dot products have very Euclidean geometry. This is more of an inner product. And it's a way of, and the symbol for an inner product is this, where we have some value, comma, <laughs> some other value, um, uh, T, X, X. And what it is, product, that looks like this. This is the math symbol for it. And so, which is, it takes the tangent at a point and cross products it, or inner products it, let's say, at a, another, with a, another point, this is Z, sorry. And that pretty, oh, okay, what, what? <laughs> On, on each tangent space, we define an inner product, which is that, which is additionally assumed to depend smoothly on the position of x. So here's the x. A, a Riemannian metric in differential geometry and allows for forming local measurements of angles, distances, and volumes. 
A manifold equipped with a metric is called a Riemannian manifold. What? What? Well, it's key. It's actually really key. So uh, think about what this, what this does. So all we know is that we can specify a location on the manifold, and we can compute its tangent at that point. So if you can, there's some way of squishing them together that produces a measurement. And with this, we're allowed to determine how far the angle is in relationship to each other. We can do some actual computations, not in this embedded 3D space that the planet is living in, but it's a metric, a way of measuring things on the manifold itself. You don't actually have to know that this is sitting at x equals 3, y equals 7, and z equals 2 to compute distance. We actually can do this with this. And one of the key things that they say is, think about this as a, you know, a classic example of this, that if you have an ant, oops, a very bad drawing of an ant, and the ant, ant wants to walk along this point, over here, there's another one here, and there's a path along this curved surface. If I wanted to compute this, I would go, well, what's the XYZ location of the ant? And then I, what's the XYZ location of the ant's destination? And then I'd do some stuff like, oh my god, I've got to compute how the XYZ coordinate changes along this curve, and then I've got to sum it all up. Differential geometry, they say, screw that different XYZ stuff. What we're going to do is use the tangent direction of this and the tangent direction of that and that inner product, and I'm waving my hands a lot here, but we can actually compute the distance of that line without knowing that this is sitting in a 3D space. It's all being done on the surface of this, just like driving your freaking car on the planet of the Earth. Because when you're driving along, you are in this very local space where you're just cruising along along a flat plane. You don't care that the Earth is orbiting the sun, embedded in a universe that's cruising along. You don't need to know that's the location of all that. You are just driving along the sphere, even though it looks like you're driving along to yourself, a flat plane. Same deal with the ant. It doesn't know where it is in 3D space. I'm saying this over and over again to convince both you and me of this. <laughs> right? This is, this is super important. Now, Obviously, hand wavy, hand wavy. We're, we're going to get into. We're going to get back to the convolutional neural net because think about what we're doing. We're looking at a way to take this representation, which is a curved 3D geometry of a, a cat or a sphere or or something or a social network, and we're going to use differential geometry to build this information. And with this information we might be able to do convolutions on this thing. And then once we can do convolutions, it actually, the neural nets just sort of fall out. So most of this paper is talking about how do you do convolution on a mass properly. Okay, uh, is there more concreteness to how that tangent space is represented? Or, because uh, I mean, from my understanding, inner products can be done only on vectors, or inner right. products can happen on other, or the operation of inner products can happen on something else as well. Inner products yeah, can only happen, happen on vectors, though, right? right? No. No, they, there, is, there is a tool for measuring. Yeah. Right? So you ask a really good question, and, and, and again, not the best differential geometry, but we'll see some examples of this. So keep that in your mind, because what you asked is really good. And, and, we can get to that. Okay. Um, and one more time, just because I'm going to read a little bit from the paper. It is important to note that the definition of a Riemannian manifold is completely abstract and does not require geometric realization in any space. See, I didn't. Not, it's not, not just me saying it, it's his paper as well. However, a Riemannian manifold can be realized as a subset of a Euclidean space. In which case, it is said to be embedded in that space. That's why I was using the word embedded. <laughs> um, the 
the only reason I'm reading this is because um, we did a, a movie called Beautiful Mind about uh, Nash. Uh, the, I can't remember his first name. John. Uh, John Nash. John Nash. And he had a, a, a very powerful theorem that said the Nash embedding theorem guarantees that any sufficiently smooth Ramanian manifold can be realized in a Euclidean space of sufficiently high dimension. So there, no matter whether you're on a sphere or on a funky ass uh, curve or something like that, you can always embed it in the space. Again, we don't we want to back off from any kind of reliance on, on embedding. That's okay. And then one other cool thing, an embedding is not necessarily unique. Two different realizations of a Riemannian metric are called isometries. So again, you can see that the, the sphere can be all over the place. There's a lot of embeddings that work for a sphere. Um, you want to make sure that the Riemannian metric works in any case. Okay, so calculus on a manifold. It's not, it's not as sad as it looks, but we're going to get to it. Our next step is to consider functions defined on manifolds. And this is where we're getting whether or not we're looking at uh, uh, the shape of an object or whether we're looking at the texture defined on an object. And notice when I've been drawing these pictures that I've stopped drawing triangles or quads, and that's on purpose. Uh, right now we're heavily into calculus land here. Um, and so all this stuff is assuming a continuous smooth surface that doesn't necessarily have an underlying structure. We just know that we're sitting on a sphere. We're not, I mean, we're not relying on the, the sphere be set up from triangles, right? It could be quads, could be all sorts of weird, you know, a soccer ball kind of sphere. It could be just a smooth parametric sphere. All right, scalar field. You can have a scalar field on our manifold. Aha, always going back to convolutional neural nets, we could be doing convolutions on the value of the scalar field. Smooth function, f, which takes a um, Ramanian manifold and turns it into a value, a, a, a real number, a real, real value. A tangent vector field also exists. is a capital F function that takes a manifold and turns it into a tangent um, uh, bundle. Uh, you know, it, it can take the manifold and put it into a tangent space. All right. We define the Hilbert spaces. Uh, yes, we're going to do this. We define Hilbert spaces of scalar and vector fields on manifolds to have noted by this will go um, F, lowercase f, and g, which are two scalar fields. Oops, now we're doing the dot product. So, you know, you can do dot products on, or inner products on things. And this is, that's, that's this Hilbert space, um, equals the integral over the entire manifold of And this is the whole thing, dx. And we're going to do this. So hold on. And there's a reason I'm writing this down, because it's L2 dx integral x minus capital X, um, capital F x, comma, dx. Dot the inner product of that. Okay. What? what? So what what have we done? Uh, as we'll see the as we will see in the following, tangent vector fields are used to formalize the notion of infinitesimal displacements on the manifold. And that's that's one of the keys. Is that um, you know, in Euclidean space, if I've got an XYZ location, 
figuring out what the point is that's just a little bit away from me. It's just adding a little epsilon to x, y, and z, and you scoot over, and you're in uh, that you've got a little delta space. But here, I've been very vague about what exactly x is. X is a point on the manifold. But remember, this manifold could be a bazillion dimensions. It can be crazy. It can blow your mind in terms of that. And also, it, it doesn't really have, it's not x, x, and x, y. It's x. It's a point on space. So if I'm doing something like this, where I'm integrating over the surface of the manifold, and I've got a dx, how do I do that? How do I do that? This, I assume I have a scalar field that, given a point on the manifold, it returns a value. Here's another scale, scalar field, where given a point on the manifold, it returns that value. So this, it looks a little crazy, but it's not that hard. It's just taking the inverse. Move a little bit more. And this one is the same. Here we have tangent fields. That we've got tangents poking around. We're doing the integral, so we're going over, the, we're summing this thing up over the entire surface of the manifold. And we're looking at the tangent, we're looking at the tangent, we need to dot the product of the value. So that is just doing, and here we're doing a straight multiple, we're doing an inner product. And then we've got the dx. So this is just, this is like compositing two functions and figuring. Now, what the it's not that you know, two scalar fields or two tangents. You want to see what happens when you inner product them. But how do you do that? All right. You calculate the value of a function change with infinitesimal change in its argument. One of the big differences is distinguishing classical calculus from differential geometry. Is the structure on the manifold from naively? <laughs> so, doing in the that is doing it, where you take the position and you add a little delta to it in the manifold space. The conceptual leap is that that is. A Requires notions as to many equally in the tangent space. Okay. And believe me, this once we get this, we're, we're going to zip past this. And in fact, we have two minutes and we're just going to do this. And then we're going to come back to this next week and to how we're going to do convolutions on this thing. And then we'll zip right into the convolutional neural networks. All right, the differential. Ah. Uh, over now. Let's make sure everybody can see this one. Right here. <laughs> so we're going to define the differential of f. And f is right there, right? Differential of f. As an operator, df such that tx goes. All right. We define the differential of f. Yeah, and it takes the, that acting on the tangent vector field at each point f be a function. Yeah. Of x. Now this is lowercase x, um, which is equal to. X comma, and we're going to put a little dot there. T X of X. Now this little dot stands for whatever the hell you're doing, uh, uh, differentiating. And okay. Should do this right. Now. Yes. So this differential. Think about this. This is this is the the gradient of f, and this is a tangent vector that we're going to squish into here. 
So this produces a vector, and this produces a tangent vector. And we're going to look that up. So to change the value, the function value is the result of a displacement given by implying the, this, this differential vector. You do this. This was weird uh, notation that took me a while to get used to. So this thing itself is an operator, right? This isn't df of x equals this, because that thing isn't defined. That's the thing it's operating at. And this was just a weird. I, it's just, this is this little dude operating on that tangent vector, right? And this is equal to how's that? f of x times or inner product did with the dot uh, the tangent vector at that location. <laughs> So when you get down to it, this isn't all that hard, right? For differential or for a, a Riemannian manifold, we have locations, and we have a tangent vector field. That's the things that we can compute the tangents of the surface at any point. So now, if I want to know how a function is changing, I look up. The tangent vector field at the point on the surface and do an inner product with the gradient of the function at that point. So we kind of pushed it off a little bit. Now you're like, well, how do you compute this? Well, how do you, uh, is that possible to compute? Well, yeah. I mean, the, right now we're in calculus land. You could definitely compute this by you know, just looking at your function and computing that. So this is the way to sort of push this along the manifold to say, if I did a little different, a little teeny extra little motion of this on the surface, how is my function going to change? Well, this operator can tell you that. So cool. All right. And now we're going to stop. That's perfect. So we've gotten convolutional neural nets and a brief introduction to differential geometry. And we've gotten we're going to do the divergence of the gradient, and we'll do the, the um, we're going to define three different operators on the manifold itself. And then once we have that, we're going to do Fourier analysis on this, spectral analysis to do convolutions on this mesh. Or not mesh, on this manifold. And I want to go right back to this, because it is so Defined, I mean, it's defined in a, a fair way, works on meshes, on uh, um, graphs. It can even work on uh, points with a little bit of work. And the dimension of this mentions. Can be crazy. So dimension can have meshes embedded in 3D space, 7D meshes embedded in an 8D space, or more. Something's more than just images. You can you can start thinking about weird ass stuff in between things. That's cool. I think I'm bored myself. Good. <laughs> and come slap me if I did some lot of things wrong. All right. So next week, Thursday, one o'clock, we're going to finish this up. We're going to go fast, but it'll be we got the foundation now. So don't come. Bye, internet.